There are several things people need to look out for before the Antichrist arrives, but before we look at these things, it is important to first highlight this one important fact, and that is, history is moving. History isn't just random events happening without any reason. Instead, it has a clear direction and purpose, like a planned story with a start and an ending. Everything that happens is part of a bigger plan. Imagine, if you will, the universe as a grand tapestry, each thread woven with purpose, contributing to a larger picture. We are like actors on a stage, playing our parts in a narrative much grander than our individual stories. Each step, each movement, holds significance. It is all moving history down this singular line from beginning to end. Every birth and every death, every sunrise and every sunset, every war and rumor of wars, every natural disaster and pestilence is moving history from the beginning to the end. The world events that are taking place are not just chaotic random events. No, they're following a specific path that was set by God Almighty. Consider the world as a flowing river, directed by the contours of the land, yet the path it takes is no accident. The events we witness, the rise and fall of empires, the rise and fall of nations, the ebb and flow of cultures, are moving us on this timeline, each playing its part in an arrangement of events. History is moving. History is moving along a line. There's a rhythm to it, a schedule of events set by God Almighty. It's not a random collection of events, but a well-composed series of events, with a beginning, a build-up, and inevitably, a finale. Our lives, our civilizations, they are not mere footnotes, but crucial verses in this grand narrative. History is moving along a line. There was a beginning, and there will be an end. God has history on a timeline. The Bible attests to this. The Bible assures us of this reality, that we are moving along a timeline of scheduled prophetic events. In this grand narrative, there is a script a divine script outlined in the sacred texts. The Bible, particularly in its prophetic books, paints a picture of a journey, a journey towards a culmination of events, a destination preordained. Now, within this timeline and within scripture, particularly we see in Christian eschatology, time and time again, that there will be a great falling away before the Antichrist arrives. Before the Antichrist arrives, a falling away must take place. This is not mere speculation, but a prophetic foreshadowing etched in the annals of the Holy Bible. The scriptures, like signposts, point to this inevitable event. In 2 Thessalonians 2.3, for instance, we find, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. It's a reminder, a caution, that the journey is fraught with twists and turns, and we must be vigilant in our spiritual quest. Thus, history, as we know it, is more than a random series of events. It's a journey with a defined beginning, a middle, and an end. And this middle, we are told, there will be a great falling away. Now, allow me to focus on America just for a moment to highlight the great falling away. Over the past 80 years, the percentage of Americans identifying as Christians has seen notable changes. The data I found provides a glimpse into this trend, particularly over the last few decades. In the 1940s, Gallup began tracking religious preferences in the United States. In 1948, 69% of Americans identified as Protestant, 22% as Catholic, and 4% as Jewish. This early data sets a baseline for understanding the religious landscape at that time. Fast forward to more recent years, a significant decline in Christian identification is evident. In 1970, 91% of American adults identified as Christian. This number slightly decreased to 90% in 1980 and then to 86% in 1990. 
The decline continued into the 21st century, with the percentage of Americans identifying as Christians dropping to 80% in 2008 and further to 75% by 2015. Additionally, religious service attendance also reflects this trend. Currently, about a third of Americans, 31%, say they attend religious services at least monthly, which includes 25% who attend at least weekly. Conversely, two-thirds of Americans attend services infrequently or not at all. These figures highlight a gradual but consistent decline in the number of Americans identifying as Christians over the last several decades. While the percentage remains high relative to other religious affiliations, the downward trend is clear and has been attributed to various factors. This falling away is preparing the world to usher in the man of sin. This falling away is ushering our world and our nation to welcome the Antichrist. At one point, America had a large number of true believers in Christ. It still does, but not to the same level as several decades ago. And we are living in a society that has removed prayer from institutions. We are living in a generation where the Bible has been removed from institutions and schools. The world is now open to receive the Antichrist. As the fabric of society changes and the identification with Christian values diminishes, these shifts pave the way for the rise and rule of the Antichrist. Two frightening things that will happen before the second coming of the Lord. The apocalyptic passage of 2 Thessalonians 2 reveals to us what will happen before the second coming of the Lord. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 to 4. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The two Bible verses tell us that before the coming of the Lord Jesus, two things need to happen. One, Paul literally said, Jesus will not come until there is a great falling away in the church. Two, the man of sin, which is the Antichrist in person, the reveal of the man of sin. The scriptures have foretold the emergence of an individual within history who will be under the influence of Satan, thereby bringing deception to a multitude. This person's deception will be particularly effective on those who reject the truth, as they will be led astray through deceitful miracles. This individual is commonly referred to as the man of sin, or the son of perdition, and they will possess remarkable skills in deception, capable of misleading individuals from all walks of life, regardless of their social status, education or religious beliefs, no one will be immune to the deception wrought by this figure. The activities of the Antichrist will remain shrouded in mystery, fueled by the concealed power of Satan and accompanied by counterfeit miracles, false signs and deceitful wonders. The source of the Antichrist's deceptive power originates from the depths of hell as he draws energy from the god of deception himself. This dark force will bestow upon him the ability to carry out his deceitful agenda, leading countless individuals astray and causing substantial confusion and spiritual harm. He will exploit human weaknesses and vulnerabilities, appealing to their desires and preying on their lack of discernment. The man of sin will be an unprecedented figure in the annals of world history. In due course, he will reveal himself and elevate himself above all that is deemed godly. He will brazenly position himself as a substitute for God in the lives of people, becoming an object of worship. Satan's longing for worship will be fulfilled through this man of sin as he deceives humanity and presents himself as their savior. 
this deceptive figure will make promises of peace and joy in the current world, rather than focusing on the hope of heaven or a future existence. He will persuade people that he possesses what they need in the here and now, enticing them into his society, where they will be required to accept his mark to engage in commercial transactions. Herein lies one of the many distinctions between Jesus and the Antichrist. Jesus did not solely direct people's attention to the present moment. He comprehended and stressed the transient nature of this world. Jesus consistently guided people towards the eternal kingdom of heaven, reminding them of the magnificence of his father's abode. He encouraged them to set their minds on heavenly matters and not become exclusively preoccupied with earthly concerns. Yet the world we currently inhabit is consumed by a fixation on present day existence. People are fixated on immediate gratification, often neglecting contemplation of what follows in the afterlife. Many expend significant time and effort planning for retirement and pursuing financial security, oblivious to the fact that retirement is not guaranteed. However, one undeniable certainty is eternity. Every individual will spend eternity in either heaven or hell. 2 Corinthians 4.4 the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The gospel message compels us to reflect on eternity and face the reality that the present moment is temporary. The God of this age has veiled the minds of unbelievers, preventing them from perceiving the enlightening message of the gospel which unveils the glorious nature of Christ as the perfect representation of God. In due course, the man of sin will be revealed, captivating a lost world and claiming to be the ultimate source of their hopes and the remedy for all their afflictions. He will boldly assert deity, exclusive claims and demand worship reserved for God alone. Year after year, various speculations arise regarding the identity of the man of sin. Sometimes he is conjectured to be a political leader, then a wealthy tycoon, but when he emerges on the global stage, his true nature as the Antichrist will be unmistakable. Another significant event foretold by Paul is a great falling away within the church before the return of Christ. The identity of the man of sin, the Antichrist, remains undisclosed. While some biblical scholars suggest he may be alive today, this assertion, though plausible, cannot be definitively confirmed. However, one undeniable fact remains. The spirit of the Antichrist is already at work in the world. As stated in verse John 4, 2, 3, we can discern the spirit of God by acknowledging the incarnation of Jesus Christ affirming our connection to God. Conversely, any spirit that denies Jesus is not of God, but originates from the spirit of the Antichrist. This spirit has been prophesied to manifest in the world and is already active. By observing the world around us, we can detect the spirit of the Antichrist operating in various domains, including governments, entertainment, media outlets, businesses, and even educational institutions. Society's direction and the glorification of certain values provide clear indications of the presence of the Antichrist spirit in different aspects of life. Unfortunately, this spirit has also infiltrated churches, leading to the propagation of unbiblical doctrines and the emergence of new belief systems associated with the Antichrist. In the present age, Caution is imperative, as not everything bearing the label of Christian aligns with genuine Christian principles. It's essential to discern the authenticity of Christian music, as not all of it truly reflects Christian values. Similarly, not every individual standing behind a pulpit 
with a Bible is genuinely born again. The Bible warns us that some will depart from the faith, falling prey to deceiving spirits and embracing false teachings. Therefore, encountering churches promoting erroneous doctrines or witnessing unfortunate occurrences within them should not come as a surprise, as the Bible has forewarned us of these eventualities. The spirit of the Antichrist relentlessly seeks to deceive even God's chosen ones, contributing to a significant departure from the truth. False doctrines and teachings which have already infiltrated the church will play a pivotal role in accomplishing this deception. These teachings may appear convincing, luring people away from the gospel's truth and granting them a justification for indulging in sinful desires, allowing a continued state of sin. Within the church itself, a multitude of false teachers will emerge, disseminating erroneous doctrines and teachings. These deceivers won't necessarily come from outside the church. Rather, they will arise from within its own ranks. It's disheartening to acknowledge that even trusted teachers can allow the influence of the spirit of the Antichrist to sway their hearts. An illustrative instance of this occurred some years ago when a group of preachers within the church began to propagate false teachings concerning grace, salvation, and the kingdom of God. Their doctrine placed an excessive emphasis on God's grace, distorting it into a pretext for unrestrained sin. They spread the notion that God, in his abundant grace and compassion, wouldn't be concerned if his children continued in a lifestyle of unending sin. This distorted teaching gained rapid popularity, infiltrating various churches as it seemingly granted believers the freedom to live according to their worldly desires. It was indeed alarming to witness how readily many believers embraced this misleading teaching and propagated it to others. The allure of this teaching lay in its alignment with individual desires and preferences. Nevertheless, it must be recognized as a false doctrine, leading believers into sin and diverting them from the truth found in God's word. Additionally, the word of God, as stated in Romans 6, 1, 2, sternly warns against abusing God's grace as a license for sinful living. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin, that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we, that are dead to sin, live longer therein? Any doctrine that encourages or permits sinful behavior is a doctrine originating from the spirit of Antichrist and poses a risk of leading the church astray. Continual engagement in sinful living can result in a believer backsliding from their faith. Embracing false teachings reveals a lack of comprehension regarding the word of God and the divine doctrine that we profess to uphold. Such teachings, you see, are influenced by the spirit of Antichrist, aiming to fulfill the scriptures that proclaim, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. As believers, it is crucial for us to remain steadfast in prayer, stay vigilant and keep watch ensuring that we are not led away from God by the spirit of Antichrist through deceptive teachings. Look for this to occur just before the Antichrist takes power. In the book of Revelation, we are introduced to the number 666. There is a great deal of significance surrounding this number and there is still some mystery surrounding it. Revelation 13:18 states, Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, 
for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. This is the number of the first beast. This beast is not the devil. This beast is not a system, but this beast is the Antichrist, a literal man. He is Satan's chief agent. He is a man that will speak publicly and pompously against the Most High. He is a man that will seek worship and adoration. He shall change the laws of the world for his own agenda. And one of the laws he will change is that he will enforce his mark, six, 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 on the inhabitants of the earth. Now the Bible in the book of Revelation gives us wisdom, stating in Revelation 13, 18, here is wisdom. In other words, the Bible is warning us, alerting us, that when you see this number, you may know who is behind the number, and the person is the Antichrist. I am surprised at the amount of people who trivialize the number. Six, six, six. I see people wearing shirts with that number. Some people even have tattoos with this number. There are so many music bands that plaster this number on their posters. This number is not a joke. Many Bible theologians already believe that the Antichrist has already been born, and he is somewhere in the world right now, waiting for the stage to be set for his arrival on the world stage. I personally don't know if this is true or not, but one thing we do know is that his spirit is hard at work, going across the world preparing the world systems and preparing the hearts of men for his arrival. Revelation 13 verses 11 to 18 And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and 6. The issue of the mark of the beast is a serious one that people need to take seriously. The issue of the mark of the beast is an issue of worship. It signifies whom you worship and to whom you belong. It signifies ownership. The issue of the mark of the beast signifies to which kingdom you are forming a permanent allegiance. At its core, acceptance of this mark is a conscious, irrevocable alignment with Satan and a definitive renunciation of God, sealing one's eternal fate. In the shadows of the impending Antichrist's rule, the scriptures forewarn of a system, the beast system where allegiance to the beast becomes the linchpin to economic participation. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. This proclamation is stark. It suggests a totalitarian regime where economic accessibility is gatekept by the acceptance of a mark, a symbol of unwavering loyalty to the beast, and by extension, a rejection of divine sovereignty. What then are we, as vigilant believers, to discern from this prophecy? We are urged to observe the subtle genesis of this beast system. Before the mark and the explicit revelation of the Antichrist, 
there will be the establishment of a system. A system that is reflective of the beast's principles and objectives, slowly embedding itself within the socio-economic structures of the world. It's not about an immediate and overt allegiance to the Antichrist, but a gradual acclimatization to his governance and principles. A slow immersion into a world where the values and morals are dictated by the beast's system. This prelude phase is crucial for discerning Christians. It is in this time that the foundation of the beast's rule is discreetly laid, integrating its influence within the realms of governance, economy and society. The Bible calls us to be vigilant, to discern the times and to recognize the inklings of this system as it intertwines with the world structures. Believers are encouraged to be like the sons of Issachar, who understood the times and knew what Israel should do, as seen in 1 Chronicles 12.32. We as believers today should understand the times and know that the arrival of the man of sin is not a single individual. Yes, indeed, the man of sin himself will arrive and will take center stage. However, his spirit is here, and his spirit is very much a part of the very fabric of our society. This is one of the biggest mistakes people make, is believing that the rule of the Antichrist will begin only once he arrives on the world stage. That is not correct. The Bible clearly teaches us that his spirit is already at work. 1 John 4.3 and every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. His spirit is already at work today. You need to know the times you are living in. The level of sin and immorality in this generation is like no other. Sin is accessible now like no other time. You know of the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah. You know of the great wickedness of Noah's generation. God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually in the generation of Noah. You know of the wickedness of Babylon, full of idolatry, full of pride and arrogance, full of self-exaltation, debauchery and excess. Now listen to me, listen to this. The age you live in, the generation we live in, has collected all of the sins that were prevalent in all of these cities and has put them together and created our society today. The time of Sodom and Gomorrah and the time of Noah and the time of Babylon and all of their sins are in this generation. You can hold each of these periods of time in the Bible and examine all of the sins that were there in those times and then cross-examine with our generation and you will see frightening similarities. The undeniable truth is that our contemporary society has become a container, mixing the worst and most notorious times in the Bible into this generation. When one considers the depravities of Sodom and Gomorrah, the relentless wickedness of Noah's era, or the unbridled hedonism of Babylon, one might be tempted to believe those times were isolated in their sinfulness. Yet, the stark reality is that the sins, once isolated to specific cultures and periods, now pervade our daily lives, intertwined in a society of moral decay. Understand the times you are living in, and you will see that the system of the Antichrist, where you cannot buy or sell without his mark, is being set into motion. As we look at the current state of our world and the trajectory it's on, it's pivotal for us to discern the gradual establishment of a system, a precursor to the beast system, where allegiance to the Antichrist, symbolized by receiving a mark, becomes a requisite for economic participation. It's this world system, embedded with values diametrically opposed to those of the kingdom of God, 
that will pave the way for the Antichrist to take power. These advancements in technology and economic shifts do not occur in a vacuum. They are entwined with societal developments and changes in human behavior and values. The normalized acceptance of surveillance, the relinquishing of privacy for convenience, and the eroding of moral and ethical boundaries are indicative of a society that is, knowingly or unknowingly, aligning itself with the impending beast system. Our generation has indeed witnessed a convergence of sins, reminiscent of Sodom and Gomorrah, Noah's time and Babylon. The synthesis of these egregious sins within our society underscores the urgency for believers to be discerning, to be vigilant, and to fortify their faith against the escalating wave of immorality and deception. So, what are we to do as the embodiments of Christ in a world that is seemingly teetering on the brink of the last days? We are called to look for this to occur just before the Antichrist takes power. We are not to be passive observers, but active participants in God's kingdom, immersing ourselves in His Word, fortifying our spirits with His truth, and clothing ourselves in His armor. We are to be the lights in this prevailing darkness, ambassadors of His love, and proclaimers of His truth. Observing the development of the beast system isn't about living in fear, but living in awareness and readiness. It's about having our lamps filled with oil, being like the wise virgins who were prepared for the bridegroom's arrival. It's about aligning our lives, our values, our time, and our resources with the kingdom of God and His righteousness. In conclusion, looking for this to occur entails a conscious and deliberate effort to recognize the subtle yet pervasive establishment of the Antichrist's system in our world. The spirit of the Antichrist is actively preparing for his arrival. Revelation 14, 9 to 10. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead, or his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb. Despite the warning of the angel of God against accepting the mark of the beast, Many people will still go ahead and accept the mark because of a number of reasons. 1. Reason number 1. Refusing the mark will lead to financial ruin. Anyone refusing to take the mark will struggle to survive. The Antichrist will be in such a place of prominence that he will have power over the world and all of its economic activity. Under the rule and leadership of the beast, his mark will be the only approved medium of financial transaction. This will put an enormous amount of strain on individuals. It will push people and urge them toward the mark, rather than them being able to make a free choice out of their own will. The beast will use coercion. That is something you need to know about the devil. The devil is in the business of coercion. If the devil can force you to do something, he will. God, on the other hand, allows a person to make a choice and then allows them to face the consequences of their choice. Even though people are aware that receiving the mark of the beast means eternal separation from God, they will still go ahead and take the mark. Imagine a father who has to provide for his family how many people will be able to withstand the frustration of not being able to buy or sell? Enduring your family not being able to make ends meet is not an easy experience. Coercion. When multitudes have danced to the tune of the Antichrist, many more people who are willing to stand against it will have their faith weakened. People will see those around them being able to provide for their loved ones and then look at themselves struggling because they are refusing to take the mark. That is a pressure that will cause many people to comply with his mark. Reason number two, rationalization and compromise. In trying times, 
The human mind can be very adept at justifying actions that go against deeply held beliefs. People might tell themselves, it's just a mark, God will understand, or I'll accept it now for my family's sake and repent later. This internal rationalization, born out of desperation and fear, will lead many to take the mark. Reason number three, deception and miracles of the false prophet. The false prophet, as described in Revelation, will have the power to perform great wonders and miracles to deceive the masses. These miracles will appear genuine and will be used to validate the authenticity and divinity of the Antichrist. For those who are not deeply rooted in the Word of God, these miracles can be very convincing, leading them to believe that the Antichrist is a true divine figure and that taking his mark is the right thing to do. Reason number four, ignorance and lack of knowledge. Many will accept the mark simply because they are not aware of its implications. Despite the warnings, there will be countless people who are not familiar with the prophecies of revelation or have been misled by false teachings. Their lack of knowledge will unfortunately make them vulnerable to the Antichrist's tactics. The Antichrist is not coming alone. The Antichrist, he is coming to deceive the entire world. He's not just any man, he's captivating, he's got charm that can sway the masses, and he holds a power, a dark power, energized straight from the pits of hell. You have never witnessed such demonic charisma in your life. This man, He's going to deceive individuals. He's going to deceive entire nations. And yes, millions upon millions will fall into his deceitful ways. He will be clothed in demonic energy. And believe me, millions are going to bow down and worship him. He's going to present himself as a symbol of reconciliation, a beacon of peace shining in the darkness. And he's going to bring forth a false hope a counterfeit utopia, leading people astray with his deceitful light. He'll look like the answer to all the world's problems, appearing as an angel of light. He will arrive as a sheep, but he is a wolf. He will arrive as a lamb, but he is a dragon. He comes bearing no signs of corruption, but his heart, his soul, is full of corruption. But people of God, here's what many seem to forget. He will not come alone. No, he has got a right-hand man, a counselor, a confidant, ready to bring nations, leaders, people, and the whole world to their knees before him. This man will possess a supernatural influence and he will perform miracles that deceive even the very elect. So who is the Antichrist coming with? Let the Bible record speak. Revelation 13, 11 to 18. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast, 
or the number of his name, here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Revelation chapter 13 verse 12. The scripture tells us about a second beast, a false prophet, who exercises all the authority of the first beast, the Antichrist, and he makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast. Just before the Antichrist arrives, we need to look for the formation and the groundwork of a universal religion, a one-world religion, that will worship at the feet of the Antichrist, led by this false prophet. So, we're looking at a time coming upon this world where men will create a religion to suit their own desires, a universal religion that worships the Antichrist, and it's being formed right under our noses. The ground is being laid for this great deception. The world is crying out for peace, for unity, for something to believe in. And the devil, he's going to give them exactly what they want. He's going to present them with a false peace, a false unity, and a false religion. And leading this charge will be the false prophet, a man of charisma, a man of influence, a man who will perform wonders and miracles to deceive, if it were possible, even the elect. He will point the world to the Antichrist, and he will lay the grounds for this universal apostate religion. Now, this is what you need to look out for before the Antichrist arrives. The introduction of a world religion. Any time you see the mention of a world religion, you need to ask yourself what is really going on here. Because as we have spoken about time and time again on this channel, the issue surrounding the mark of the beast is one of worship. And as soon as you see the ground works for a one world religion, or for the worship of a man, you need to be very cautious. In some circles around the world, there are people who are already in talks about creating a one world religion. The false prophet will direct people's worship toward the Antichrist. Whoever the false prophet is, he is a very prominent figure, so much so that he, along with the Antichrist, will be the first two who are cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 19.20 and the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. We see in this verse that both the Antichrist and the false prophet do not die physically, Instead, they are thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. The rest of humanity has to attend the great white throne judgment, but these two don't, because they are energized by the very power of hell. Interestingly, the Bible does not give an exact location of the lake of fire. There are many assumptions about the location of this lake of fire. Some believe that it may lie outside our universe, but one thing we do know is that it is a real place. We see that before anyone else is cast in there, these two are cast in there first. Now, one thing that I have thought about a lot is just about the level of deception that will be going on during this time. Just think about how divided the world is now. Now imagine that the false prophet will lead the whole world to abandon their beliefs to worship the Antichrist. That is no small feat. To get people to leave the religions that their parents and grandparents followed and instead worship the Antichrist, the first beast, is a monumental task. Do you understand that wars have been fought because of religions? Divorces have happened because of religions? Now just think. The false prophet will lead billions to leave what they know and love to worship at the feet of the Antichrist, the false prophet, demonically energized, powered by the very gates of hell, with a deceptive power the likes of which the world has never seen. We as Christians grossly underestimate the level of deception that will happen in the last days. 
This is why Jesus warned us, saying in Matthew 24, 24, For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. It is crucial that we remain vigilant and grounded in God's word so that we are not deceived. Please listen to the word of God. We as Christian believers take this warning from Jesus Christ so lightly, but believe the word of God. In the last days, the level of deception that will be upon the earth will be like nothing the world has ever seen. There will be people who will literally view the Antichrist as a God. And I think about this at times. I really do ponder, how will he do this? But this goes to show the sheer level of deception during this time. Now let's take a close look at the job of the false prophet. The false prophet is described as having two horns, which indicates that he has some authority as a political character. Not only that, but he is also depicted as a lamb, which would point to the fact that he has a religious character, a religious background. This is why he is regarded as a prophet. Being a human, the false prophet with lying signs and wonders will successfully deceive many and turn their hearts to the Antichrist. If we look at the landscape of this world, it is evident that the world is perfectly poised to be deceived by the false prophet. Look at how people are so fascinated by ghosts. There are even groups of people who go ghost hunting. Look at how the UFO community is growing. Humans are yearning for the supernatural and the false prophet will fulfill that yearning. Look at the world's growing demand for signs and wonders. People everywhere are craving miracles and they care less whether the source of such miracles is God or not. Believers have to take great caution in this aspect because demons also have the ability to produce supernatural results. It is not all miracles that are from God. Therefore, we cannot judge the integrity of anyone just by the signs and wonders he is able to produce but by the source of such supernatural acts. The false prophet puts on quite a show to convince people that he is Messiah. The false prophet's deception and lying signs and wonders will be so convincing that the world will marvel at him and shall fall victim to his deception. It is often overlooked that Satan has miraculous powers, though limited and less extensive than God. His power is real and it will be on full display for the world. The beast rising from the earth will cause fire to come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. He will literally call fire from heaven. Can you imagine what that will do to the world? Seeing a man call fire from heaven. In the eyes of the deceived world, it answers the miracle of the two witnesses who minister during this period and are persecuted by the Antichrist and his false prophet, Revelation 11, 5. The two witnesses who were sent by God in Revelation 11 had the power to shut the heavens from giving rain and to call fire from their mouth. However, the beast rising from the earth will also counterfeit such supernatural acts in order to prove his supremacy. To the deceived world, this also puts the false prophet in the class of Elijah, the first Kings 18, who had the power to call down fire from heaven. This false prophet will have real supernatural power. The beast was also granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast could both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. The beast rising from the earth will use a deceptive, animated image as the focal point of the worship of the beast. With the combined effects of the miracles performed by the false prophet and the two beasts, people will be allured to receive the mark of the Antichrist. The beast will force people to accept the mark of the beast by denying those who do not have the mark the right to buy or sell. By making life unbearable, the beast will coerce people to both worship the image and also accept his mark to live. The implication of worshipping the beast is that those who worship it do not have their names written in the Book of Life. No one who worships the beast will enter into the Kingdom of God. 
This shows how greatly God detests the sin of idolatry. He commanded us not to serve any other God other than Him. We are not permitted to bow down to any image as believers because the only subject of our worship must be God and God alone. Therefore, anyone who receives the mark of the beast will forever be alienated from God and their eternal destruction is certain because they have given their souls to the devil as a possession and cannot be numbered with God's people anymore. Unfortunately, the false prophet's display of great signs works. He leads those who dwell on the earth astray. In the treacherous days leading up to the arrival of the Antichrist, a veil of deception will shroud the earth. We must be vigilant and discerning, looking for the subtle yet profound shifts in the spiritual realm. Look for this to occur just before the Antichrist arrives is not merely a sermon title, but a clarion call for awareness and spiritual readiness. Beware, for the ground will be fertile for the seeds of deception planted by the false prophet to flourish and grow into a monstrous tree of idolatry. The world in its desperation for answers and solutions will be ripe for manipulation. The people, tired and weary from chaos and confusion, will be searching for a savior, not realizing that they are being led astray. Look for this to occur just before the Antichrist arrives. And understand that this is a time for the children of God to be rooted in His Word, unmovable and discerning of the times.